Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully, everyone's in the right spot. And then GSO seminar. If you're in the wrong stop, spot, don't leave. So today we're hosting Dr. Andrew Reifel. He's a research fishery ecologist with the Wisconsin DNR. And Andrew received his bachelor's from St. Louis University in environmental science, a master's in fisheries from Auburn, and a PhD in ecology <coughs> from the University of Alabama. And then he also conducted a collaborative postdoc with the U.S. Forest Service, the University of Mississippi, and Washington University in St. Louis on freshwater mussel conservation. And he also served as a faculty member at Virginia Tech for a short period. And in addition to being a fisheries research ecologist, he also holds an appointment as a research fellow at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Center for Limnology. And currently, <laughs> among with a lot of other accomplishments in your short time, he also have, has over 40 peer-reviewed journal articles out. And today he will be talking about a renewed need for fisheries ecology <laughs> in our rapidly changing world. All right, thanks. Um, so thank you, Chris. Thank you, um, everybody, for having me um, talk here. I've I've always been interested in Iowa State and the fisheries program at I Iowa State. Um, going back to Carlander, um, if you don't have Carlander's books, you should get them. I feel like it's text that every fisheries student at least should have. Um, and then the you know the co-op program really came out of Iowa State. So I feel like this has been sort of a center for fisheries ecology and conservation. So it's a great place to talk. I'm very pleased to be here, interact with everybody. And I just want to talk a little bit about my research today, um, some of the ideas I'm interested in, some of the challenges that I encounter um, in an agency research environment, um, and how I see sort of the future shaping up in terms of how we think about um, fisheries management, fisheries ecology in the context of management. Um, so this is um, just a fun title slide that I put together of different places I've been, different things I've worked on, and it's just meant to give you sort of a breadth of kind of all the places I've been, things I've done. And I want to start off by showing this figure, which is a figure that probably a lot of you have seen before. Um, oftentimes you'll see this in the introductory pages of a fisheries textbook, and it's supposed to illustrate the three-legged stool of fisheries management. So. Um, fisheries are really managed um, by managing fish, people, and habitat. And oftentimes, management is occurring at the interaction of all those different areas. Now, <clears throat> I think it's a great conceptual framework. It actually came out of wildlife management. But if you think about what fisheries ecology is, which is really the, the study of fish species and how they relate to their environments, which you'll, what you might come up with is a very similar graphic which is that fisheries ecology is also about how fish interact with habitats, how they interact with people, and how people are changing all of that. And so this is sort of a long-winded way of, for me to say that I think fisheries management and fisheries ecology are not as disparate as people have made them out to be over the years. And that we're actually studying a lot of the same things and we're just calling them different things. So I want to present some of the examples of my work and try to maybe convince you a little bit of that argument. So this is a, um, an example of that same sphere, but what I've done here is scaled the size of the spheres to how much money um, a certain state, um, which will remain nameless, <laughs> spends on each of these different spheres. And so what you can see is that in true fisheries management in the world, we spend most of our money um, thinking about fish um, for obvious reasons. That's what we see. That's what we're used to thinking about. Um, we spend um, a lot less money thinking about people and how people interact with that resource. And then a very teeny <laughs> sliver thinking about habitat. Um, I think a lot of where our policies fall down is because of the size of these different spheres. So this is the problem with natural resources in a lot of ways as I see it. We have a huge human population on Earth. We're sitting at around 7 billion people. Um, we're slated to go to over 9 billion people by the year 2050. And this is putting exceptional pressure on natural resources, on aquatic ecosystems, and on our, on our fisheries. Um, this is just a little analysis um, somebody did a while ago now, but showing projected extinction rates in aquatic and terrestrial environments. And this is showing that it's going to be more of a problem in aquatic ecosystems. These are sensitive taxa, these are sensitive environments, and humans are having a disproportionate effect on these environments. 
So some people ask me, well, why are you interested in fishing? And there's a lot of reasons. So first of all, and I think this is one of the strongest cases you can make, is that fishing is big business. Um, so they come out with these estimates about what the economic impact of fishing is in the U.S. and in different states. So for example, in the U.S., anglers have over a $100 billion economic impact every single year. That supports um, over 800,000 U.S. jobs. And then just to throw some Iowa data at you, you're you know, five, almost a $500 million impact in this state and about 5,000 jobs. So it's big business, and that's why we should be interested in it from an economic standpoint. Now, there are also culturally important resources. In this picture is me <laughs> as a kid. And so I got interested in this stuff because I grew up fishing. A lot of people get interested in um, natural resources in conservation because they grow up with an interest in it. So they're economically important. They're also culturally important. These are the five big threats to fisheries at all scales as I see them. And I use this sort of conceptual um, diagram to show how I've kind of structured my research program. So my research program is really um, all about trying to understand all these different impacts and the impact that those things have on fisheries. And so today I'm going to spend most of my time talking about exploitation and climate change. Um, and I want to start off by um, some exploitation work. And this is stuff that I've done in Wisconsin. Um, so Wisconsin is famous for many things. Most importantly, the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> Not doing so well, but I have faith that they will improve as the season goes on. Um, but on the fishery side of things, we have a lot of great resources. We have great lakes fisheries, um, like salmon. We have um, the best um, lake sturgeon fishery in the world in Lake Winnebago. We have walleye all over the state. Um, some are naturally reproducing, some are not. Um, and we have panfish all over the place. This is the species that gets fished more than any other species. Um, and this is kind of what the Wisconsin DNR is charged with managing, this incredibly diverse and abundant resource um, that's economically important, that's culturally important. And my job is really to help provide science that can improve the management of these resources. So I want to start talking about walleye a little bit. So walleye are kind of a big deal in Wisconsin. Um, they're probably kind of a big deal in Iowa as well. Um, they're popular for a variety of reasons. They're a recreational sport fish. Um, there's tournaments for them. They're popular in fish fries. This is a historically very Catholic region that has fish fries on Fridays. Um, so this is an important fish for the region, and people are constantly interested in ways to sustainably manage walleye. But to say it's complicated would be a huge, huge understatement. Um, this is the most complicated fishery I've ever dealt with. Um, it's a mixed tribal and recreational fishery. So in the mid-1980s, the Native American tribes in Wisconsin redeclared their treaty rights to spear fish, um, mainly walleye in the springs. And this set off a chain reaction that led to protests at boat landings, um, a big court case, um, there was even a book written about it called The Walleye War, which is a, a great book for those interested in the topic. Um, but this led to a, a very intricate management system over time that involves the DNR taking population estimates on all our walleye lakes, understanding exploitation through creel surveys, getting information from tribal nations on how much walleye they were spearing. <coughs> but there is trouble in paradise. Um, going back to the original movie. And the, the trouble basically revolves around declining walleye recruitment. So we have, as I mentioned, naturally reproducing walleye populations. But that natural reproduction has been declining over time. And it's declining at kind of an alarming rate. So we're losing about um, almost 7% natural reproduction a year. And nobody knows why. This is the big mystery. Um, so I'm open to any and all explanations for what is <laughs> causing the decline of walleye in Wisconsin. but. There are many potential explanations. Um, this is a map showing the location of declines. So the, the more blue the dots are in this map, the more significant the declines have been. Greens would be increases in recruitment. So you can see that there are some increases in some places, but for the most part, everything is blue. Recruitment is going down. 
Now at the same time, largemouth bass densities, which are conspecific with walleye, um, their densities have been going up over the same time period. So you can see there's all green dots on this map and very few blue dots. So we have bass going up and walleye going down, and this is what's become known as the quote unquote bass walleye problem um, that everybody seems to notice and nobody seems to be able to understand. So there's a big team of us in Wisconsin that are working on this. These are people at the Madison Center for Limnology, the DNR, um, the co-op unit at Stevens Point, graduate students, postdocs, and we're all working on various components of this issue, which obviously is very complex. This is a graph that um, my colleague John Lyons made of all the potential interactions that could be occurring with walleye and bass um, in these food webs. So you can see that there's exploitation changes going on, there's shoreline development, there's invasive species, there's warming temperatures, lake level changes, and there's all these interactions that could be occurring. And it, it's very, very difficult to pick out which are the most important elements of this process. So I'm going to focus on one element of this big spaghetti mess here, um, and that's exploitation. <coughs> so I'm going to do this in kind of an interesting way. Um, this is a gentleman some of you may be familiar with named Art Benke. Now, Art Benke was a professor of mine at Alabama. And if you know Art Benke at all, what you'll know about him is that he's really into secondary production. Um, He's a benthic ecologist, stream ecologist, a lifelong hardcore member of NABS, now the Society for Freshwater Science. But Art Benke had a huge influence on me because he convinced me that I should be thinking about secondary production. So secondary production is basically the analog to primary production, but for animals. So the idea is that uh, ecologists have been able to much better understand um, terrestrial environments by understanding primary productivity. Um, and secondary productivity allows a lens through which you might understand similar dynamics. And his argument went something like, look at all these famous fisheries biologists <laughs> over time, and all these famous fisheries people thought about um, fish production, and you should too. And uh, long story short, I kind of wound up agreeing with him. So if you ask Google what production is, it will tell you. Uh, I always like asking Google what it thinks. Google will tell you that it's a process of combining various material inputs and immaterial inputs in order to make something for consumption, <laughs> which in this case might not be that far from the truth. Um, some other people might think about fish production in an aquaculture sense, um, growing fish in ponds, producing fish that way. And that, that is also a true, um, a true way of thinking about production. Um, but it turns out there are uh, long existing methods for calculating production, production rates in fish populations. And so production is actually the, the accumulation of living matter or biomass by an animal population over a period of time. And mathematically that's expressed as growth times biomass. Um, a lot of people have thought about fish biomass over time, which is kind of a static measure. But production is a rate or a flux, and so it's much more dynamic. It tells you a lot more information because it's incorporating growth and biomass changes. So this can be found in you know, some basic fisheries textbooks. This is how you calculate production, something called an Allen curve. I don't want to spend too much time going over the math of this, but basically how you do it is you integrate the area under this curve um, mathematically to get um, production, which is then expressed in kilograms per hectare per year or pounds per acre per year if you're an English person. <laughs> And so I wanted to do this for walleye. I thought we might be able to learn something about walleye and about sustainable walleye harvest through a production lens. So what you need to do this for walleye is you need a population estimate, a PE from a mark recapture study. Some information on the size structure, we get this out of our spring netting data. Some information on the growth rates, so that's taken from otoliths or spines or uh, something like that, tells you what the growth rates of the fish population are. A conversion, if you don't have weight, you need a conversion equation for length weight relationship. And you need to know the water body size. And using all this information, you can, collect, you can calculate secondary production rates of walleye populations. <coughs> now, why is that important? These are some metrics you can get out of that. 
I don't want to keep boring you with lists, but I do, I think it's important to walk through some of these. So you can get the biomass, which is the standing stock amount of walleye mass that's out there. You can get the production, which is the change in that mass per unit area over time. And then you can get something called the P to B ratio. That's the ratio of the production to biomass. And what that actually is, is the biomass turnover rate. So for example, if you had a P to B ratio of one, it would mean that the biomass in whatever population you're interested in turns over every year, once a year. Um, if you had a P to B ratio of 0.1, it would mean every 10 years. If you had a P to B ratio of two, it would be twice a year. And so it tells you a lot about the dynamics of, of production of that species, of energy flow in that system, the productivity of populations. Now on top of that, you can get um, yield or harvested biomass. That comes out of a creel survey. So people sitting at boat landings, interviewing anglers, and you calculate the total mass that comes off of um, all the anglers harvest over the course of a year. And then this is the big one is you can get something called the yield to production ratio. Some, this has been called the ecotrophic coefficient in some cases. And this is the metric that I've focused on. This is how you can get at sustainability. Because if you know what the production rate of a population is, and you know what the yield that people are harvesting off that population is, the simple ratio of those two variables tells you a lot about how sustainable your harvest is. For example, if you have a ratio of one, that means that 100% of the annual production is being harvested by, an by anglers. And that um, exploitation above that would be predicted to deplete biomass over time. So I've really latched onto this idea of, of yield to production as a simple way of uh, incorporating um, some information on sustainability. And I just want to point out that these are um, metrics that derive from ecology. Um, dating all the way back to Lindemann, that's the most famous paper in limnology, he talked about the energy flow, flow of energy in systems. And that's what production is. Production is tying into understanding energy flow in aquatic ecosystems. And it's been kept up over time. These are quantitative food webs that were drawn. This is a nutrient addition experiment where they're, they had reference streams and then they're adding nitrogen to some streams so you can see the thickness of the arrows change. The thickness of these arrows are based on production estimates. Calculating production, calculating how that's changed since they added nutrients. So it's an ecological concept. So the big million dollar question in Wisconsin is what is sustainable harvest? What is it? Um, and we have, when I first started looking at this, we have one particular lake that has really good information on walleye that we wanted to focus on first. It's called Escanaba Lake. It's in Vilas County, Wisconsin, northeast Wisconsin. And Escanaba is unique for two reasons. One, it has a great walleye population on it. Um, it has probably the best walleye population in Wisconsin. Um, and two, it has the longest running perpetual creel survey in the world. Um, there's a building that's at the landing, and if you want to fish on Escanaba Lake, you have to stop at the building, fill out a permit, um, you go fishing, and then you come back, you fill out the rest of the permit, and you say exactly what you caught, how many, how big. And we have um, over 70 years of perpetual creel survey on this lake now. So we know every single fish that's ever been caught out of that lake and harvested. Um, so it's a perfect place to go after some of these quantitative ideas. These are just uh, frequency histograms of some of the production metrics from Escanaba Lake. So as you can see, um, production is kind of high. Um, so here's a lake from Iowa here, Clear Lake, Iowa. Um, this is from Carl Anders' book, actually. Um, and then here's uh, some data from a lake in Ontario. So you can see the Escanaba, from a production standpoint, is kind of like a Canadian lake, really productive for walleye. Um, biomass follows a similar trend. And here's some information on the P to B ratios, so about 0.2 a little bit over 0.2. So once every five years, walleye biomass is turning over in Escanaba Lake. That's the estimate. And this is the big graph um, from this study. So this is relating exploitation as a percentage of the production. That's that Y to P ratio. That's the amount. So every dot on this graph represents a year's worth of data. And so we have exploitation as a fraction of the production. Then down here on the x-axis is exploitation as a, as a percent of the population estimate. 
This is important because this is what we manage on. This is what the DNR thinks about when they think about exploitation. I think about this, um, but the DNR thinks about that. They want to know what's, what's the million dollar um, sustainable exploitation rate for walleye populations. So as you can see, the, the, as you exploit more of the adult population, you also exploit more of the annual production. And the big question <coughs> is, is where does that line cross 100%? So here's 100%. So all, this is, these are cases where you're overfishing in the red. You're harvesting more than the annual, than the population is producing that year. Um, and you look at where does this regression line cross that 100% line? It's at 20%. Um, this is part of what, what you have to do in an agency job is you have to provide magic numbers. <laughs> so in the case of Escanaba Lake, the magic number is 20%. And there's variation around that, but um, you know, when I first got that number, I thought, geez, that's kind of low. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I should be saying this. <laughs> but it turns out that right when I um, came up with that answer, a guy named Nigel Lester, who's a Canadian uh, fish researcher, published a, a very similar paper. It was based on different types of data, growing degree days and life history characteristics. But it suggested that for an area like Wisconsin, with the amount of growing degree days we have, Sustainable exploitation should be 20%. Um, the exact same answer. And so I said, okay, now I can publish it. <laughs> so um, we didn't want to stop here. We wanted to, and this was just, that was just in one lake, and so we weren't sure if that same answer applied to the rest of our walleye population. So we wanted to take a step further and do the same analysis for all of our walleye populations across the state. So um, we hired a postdoc. <laughs> <laughs> to do a lot of the coding of this work. It is a high quantitative drain to calculate these things sometimes. So we hired um, Daisuke to calculate these production metrics and look at this at more of a regional scale. So these are results that are coming off of his postdoctoral work at the CFL. <coughs> Here's a similar graph as I showed for Escanaba, but across all the ceded territory, all, all of northern Wisconsin walleye lakes. And I want you to notice a couple of things here. First of all, that the graph is skewed towards the left. So most of our walleye lakes are low biomass lakes. You know, we like to think that we have a ton of biomass everywhere, but in fact, most of our lakes are low biomass lakes. And if you compare our biomass numbers to some other published values, um, like in the south, well, I actually do occur down south, but they have very low biomass numbers. Here's Iowa right here. Um, here's Oneida Lake in New York, and then here's Canada. Canada has super high biomass values. So Wisconsin sits as a median somewhere in between Iowa and Oneida Lake. So there's a definite latitudinal trend to walleye biomass that is interesting in its own respect. Here's the same graph, but with production rates. Um, so it's even more exaggerated, more exaggerated, skewed towards that left. So most of our walleye lakes are low production systems. Um, that's a very important point. We can't fool ourselves thinking that we have high production systems everywhere. Most of them are low production systems. But what's neat is you can pull out lakes and lake year combinations. So these are lakes that have really low um, combinations of production. These are lakes that have super high values. And then there's Escanaba Lake, again, on the high side. And these are the spatial patterns in walleye production across Wisconsin. So the bigger the point, the more the production. And the point here is that our northeastern lakes, which are deeper, colder, um, a little bit less productive in terms of um, primary, primary productivity, that's where we have more walleye production. This is where walleye production is highest. It's about 1.5 times higher than walleye production in the west, which is shallower lakes, more fertile. Um, so those are the good lakes in the northeast. And this is kind of an interesting graph showing the relationship between production and biomass. So every point on here is a different lake or different walleye population. So what you can see is a few things on here. Um, first of all, biomass is a really good predictor of production. Um, if you have a lot of biomass, you're going to have a lot of production. There's error all around that. But then you can look at lakes that kind of are bucking the trend. So these lakes in red here are lakes that have um, not a lot of biomass, but a high production rate. 
So they should have more biomass than they, than they actually have. So these are lakes where something's going on. Um, so you might think they're getting harvested too much. Um, but another way of looking at it is that they have a strong recovery potential. If you just took your foot off the gas a little bit, they might recover. Now contrast that with these blue lakes down here. These are lakes that have um, really low production rates, but high biomass. So these are the equivalent of like an old growth forest. Um, they grow slow, they're not productive, but when you sample the walleye, they're really big. Um, so these are lakes where you might think about conservation. Um, you know, s people could go in there and clean it out really fast and they'd be gone. So it's kind of an interesting way. And, and the relationship between those two is actually showing you the average P to B rate as well. So production divided by biomass. So it's about 0.2. The slope of that line is at least. It's basically P to B. Okay, so this is the harvest evaluation. Um, same thing as we did for Escanaba Lake, but throughout the whole seeded territory. And the answer is, ding, 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 21%. Um, so very, very similar to the result from Escanaba. And if you break that out by um, just spearing, if you look at just spearing, you get 21%. If you look at just angling, you get about 20%. If you look at them combined, you get about 21%. So everything constantly keeps converging on this value of close to 20% is the sustainable number for walleye. These are trends in those production statistics over time. And so this is showing sort of uh, the recruitment problem as well. Um, so we're having declining biomass, about 7% over time. Production has declined by about 50% in Wisconsin. 50%, that's pretty crazy. And P to B ratio has also declined. That's, that's a problematic as well. I think these trends are being driven by the lack of recruitment. And that's a big, that's a big factor that goes into these calculations. Now this is what's interesting about this story, is that <coughs> exploitation rates as a percentage of the population estimate have been very constant over time. On average, we exploit about 12% of, of populations across the region, almost consistently. And that hasn't changed over time. It bounces around, but on average, it's 12%. So everybody thinks everything's fine in terms of what we're exploiting. But the problem is production's going down, OK? So you're exploiting at the same rate, but because production's going down, your Y to P ratio is going up over time. So this is what Post talked about in his famous fisheries paper as the invisible decline. Um, you can be monitoring one thing, but because you're not looking at another thing, you're missing an important dynamic that's going on. So as you can see, we've been exploiting over time more and more and more of the annual production to the point where in the Northwest, we're at almost 100%. In the Northeast, we're at about 70%. This is a big deal. Again, everybody thinks things are fine, that exploitation is not a problem because we haven't changed exploitation. But the productivity <coughs> is changing underneath the exploitation, and that's causing potential overfishing <coughs> problems. Um, so that's basically the story with walleye, as, as I'm starting to understand it on the exploitation side of things. But again, there's all sorts of factors going on, and this is just one piece of the puzzle. So I just want to wrap up by quoting um, Tom Waters, who pioneered a lot of these techniques and whose techniques I've stolen <laughs> to look at this stuff. And he, he said very um, appropriately that he believes there's an added advantage to relating harvest to production rather than a static standing stock. Both harvest and production are rates based on annual dynamics. The coefficient clearly illustrates the proportion of energy, again, ecological energy, removed by angling to the energy added by production. So it makes sense to me. I'm really pushing for use of these sorts of approaches, and I think it's kind of neat. All right, let's um, change it up a little bit and talk about panfish. This is another um, area that I'm working on pretty intensively. Um, panfish are probably the most abundant species that we deal with in Wisconsin. They're important in that um, they're caught more than any other species of fish by anglers. Um, the problem is you can't find a lot of fish like this anymore. <laughs> Unless you go to really far-flung places in the middle of nowhere where nobody else goes. So what's happened over time is that panfish sizes have <laughs> declined because we have really liberal harvest regulations for those species. So these 
These are graphs um, of big data that is basically our fisheries management database um, compiled in these graph graphs over all the time. So each of these graphs holds like millions of measured fish in them. It's all the data the DNR has ever collected on fish sizes. And what the blue points represent are mean size of these species, and the green points represent maximum sizes. And what I want you to notice here is that these species on the top, which are panfish species, have all experienced declines in size structure over time. Um, this is also referred to sometimes as fishing down the food web. Um, people will talk about that. Um, but if you contrast those patterns to other species, like white sucker, which kind of don't get fished, they kind of haven't changed, there's no trend at all. Or musky that collapsed, people overfished them, and then they said, that's not a good idea. And they started catching and releasing musky and putting conservative regs, and they've responded back to historical levels. Or walleye that kind of have fluctuated but haven't changed, and northern pike, which are kind of like musky. Um, so we definitely have a problem with panfish size structure. And the big question is, what are we going to do about it? So we held a series of hearings around Wisconsin, kind of showing them those graphs and asking them, are you interested? What are you interested in doing about this? Are you interested in doing anything? And the short answer we got is that about a third of people wanted to do something. Um, a third of people said, no, thank you. I like my high bag limits. See you later. And a third of the people said, I don't really know. Um, so we weren't really sure what to do with that. Um, sort of information. It's kind of kind of an equivocal social response. Um, but some people rightfully pointed out that we had a series of lakes that a long time ago were put on reduced bag limits. They dropped the bag limit from 25 down to 10, but there hadn't been any evaluation of them. And so I thought, man, this is a great science question. It's right from the anglers. We can provide anglers an answer that they want. It can help move the management forward. And so I did this sort of um, analysis of, of effect of a reduced bag limit on, on about eight lakes that, um, you know, they've been put on the regulation at different times. But what you, the bottom line is what you see is that a reduced bag gives you, relative to control lakes, about an inch in mean size and about a half of an inch in maximum size. So it improves it. Um, but is that a lot? Is that, it's, it's, it's statistically significant, but is it biologically and socially significant? For some people it is. An inch can be a lot. Um, seven inches to eight inches for a bluegill fisherman might be a lot. Um, but for others it might not be. And so that, then it really becomes sort of a social question about whether the juice is worth the squeeze. Um, one thing we did learn from this is that there wasn't an appetite for a statewide change to the regulation. But there was interest in doing something on lakes that had problems where we thought angling might be the cause. Um, so we identified these lakes, um, identified about 100 of the lakes that kind of applied to this scenario. And these are lakes that have bad size structure but good growth. So um, based on those two metrics, we think that angling might have been the problem and why the size structure went down. And we proposed a statewide sort of science study on these 100 lakes to see if we could help them out. And so we proposed taking 100 of these lakes and putting them on a series of experimental um, reduced bag limits. And there was a lot of thought that went into how to, what those regulations should be. Um, but they were basically more 10 bags, five bags, which were hard to get past, um, and then a a reduced bag limit during the spawning season. This is another thing that people talk a lot about is quote unquote fishing on the beds. Um, so we pushed this plan forward um, and it passed our Conservation Congress and it's going into effect next year. And I'm really proud of it. It shows how you can do something. There, there wasn't overwhelming support to, to change the statewide regulation, but we were able to pass something that moves the ball forward, uses science, and I think it's going to help um, help those populations in our state. And just to show how tough this issue is, this is one of my favorite pictures. This is Aldo Leopold as a child. <laughs> and look what he's got. He's got a stringer of panfish. Um, so even the king of conservation, who Wisconsin likes to claim, but is from Iowa. And so this is actually on his family Iowa house. 
Um, even the king of conservation couldn't resist a nice stringer of panfish. Shows how hard that problem is to deal with. Okay, I want to uh, um, spend some time talking about climate change um, and some of, the, some of the work I've been doing with there. This is kind of an interesting study I've been involved with recently involving Cisco. Cisco are a cold water um, fish endemic to um, northern North American lakes. Um, so at the southern end of their range is Indiana and they occur all the way to Canada. What's interesting about this is that now Indiana, Wisconsin, and Minnesota have all done comprehensive surveys of lakes that were historically known to have Cisco's and they've gone back to those same lakes and seen if they can find them. So I'm leading sort of a multi-state effort to synthesize that information across the region to see where are we losing Cisco, where are we not losing Cisco, and we found some pretty interesting patterns. <coughs> so this is a map of all of the lakes that have Cisco, and I've coded the colors. So the black are Cisco populations that have not been extirpated, and the red are populations that have been extirpated. Again, this is a collaboration with agencies and UW-Madison, LTER. And what you can see is this sort of latitudinal trend in extirpation. There's a lot of red in the south. So Indiana's lost almost 95% of their Cisco populations. And in northern Minnesota, they've lost none. And then you have sort of a gradation in between. Now if you put these on a graph, it looks like this. This is, mean, or this is um, percent extirpated by um, half degree latitudinal band. And you can see that in the south, you've lost almost all of them. And in the north, you've lost almost none. And then there's this gradation in between. This, this graph is kind of an interesting plot showing Cisco Lake um, depths plotted against areas. And then they're broken out into stratified and non-stratified lakes. So the blue lakes are stratified lakes. The red lakes are non-stratified lakes. And then the black points are extirpations. These boxes are extirpations that have happened in the south in the southern part of that area. And what I want you to take away from that is that they've happened in the south in deep lakes and shallow lakes, big lakes and small lakes. But in the north, you're seeing extirpations in much shallower lakes, um, much smaller lakes. And so the, the south is just in trouble in general. And as this sort of effect proceeds north, you're going to see losses, particularly in these non-stratified lakes that are shallower. That's what this data shows. Those are the ones that are vulnerable to extirpation. Now, um, things don't just go extinct, um, or they don't just get extirpated. Lots of things have to happen before things get wiped out. Um, so one, again, ecological principle that I've been drawn to is something called Bergman's Rule. Anybody ever heard of Bergman's Rule? OK. So it's sort of an old um, concept in ecology that's been very controversial over time highly studied, and it basically says that body size increases with latitude. Um, and it was originally worked on primarily with mammals. Mammals show strong evidence of Bergman's rule with everything. So for example, moose body size increases with latitude. Um, you can think about deer skulls from Michigan versus Nicaragua. They show this Bergman's rule pattern. And even humans show evidence of Bergman's rule. Humans tend to be bigger in more northern locations, at least historically. <laughs> now, with poikilotherms, it's, it's been um, much more variable. There's been a lot of debate about which species show it, which don't. Um, they don't all show Bergman's rule. Um, some do, some don't. And so I've been interested in this um, concept for fishes. And I, I did a paper a couple years ago now on uh, the manifestation of Bergman's rule in North American freshwater fishes. And the basic pattern that came out of this was that there was a very specific group of species that showed Bergman's rule. And it was cold water fish species. Every single cold water or cool water fish species shows Bergman's rule. So um, walleye show Bergman's rule. They're small in the south, they're big in the north. Trout show Bergman's rule, small in the south, big in the north. Warm water species either show the opposite, so bass are big in the south, small in the north, or they show no pattern whatsoever. But it's cool, it's a cool pattern because it shows how species are going to react to climate warming. So cold water species, as, as 
climate gets warmer, those species are going to shrink. That's what this says, is that before they get extirpated like Cisco, they're going to get smaller in their body size. So I think this is a great example of how ecological theory can be useful for conservation and management. Useful for thinking about it, useful for setting expectations. You know, for example, if you manage trout in the Appalachians, you shouldn't think that you're going to grow brook trout like they do in Canada. Um, they show Bergman's rules. So they're going to be small in the south. Um, and so it's a way of thinking about expectations, thinking how body size is going to react to climate warming. This is just two examples. Again, this is brook trout um, showing how their body size reacts to latitude and largemouth bass, so opposite trends. Now, um, why do they show that? Um, why do cold water species show Bergman's rule and other species don't? I don't have a good answer, and I'm very interested in why that is, and I only have theories to present. <laughs> but one of the theories, so Bergman originally talked about the surface area to volume ratio of organisms, and that it was a, a heat conservation thing. Um, but I'm not going to go into it. There's very little evidence that that is supported for fishes, that that, that is a, a potential mechanism. What I do think is a potential mechanism is something called countergradient growth. This is something that David Conover worked on. He originally worked on it with silver sides. So he collected um, this sort of uh, minnow species silver side from Nova Scotia all the way south to Florida. He brought them back to, I think, Stony Brook is where he is. Um, but he raised them in common gardens. He raised them in the same environment, but they're from different locations. And what you find when you do that is that fish from the north grow faster. They grow faster in a common garden when all things are equal. And the idea here is that this is an evolutionary adaptation to shorter growing seasons. So fish in the north, they have shorter growing seasons to deal with, and there's been selection on faster growth to get big before that first winter um, so that they don't die. Um, so this could be going on with fishes at a much broader scale. Um, this is a paper that some Canadian researchers published on lake sturgeon that shows a similar trend. Um, but they got this data using a different approach. They used um, length at age information from growth curves that they got from spines. And they figured out a way to standardize growth rate by the amount of growing degree days that those fish accumulated in their life. So it's a way of getting at countergradient growth without doing the common gardens. So I've kind of latched on to this technique in a little, a little bit. Um, so this is from a book chapter I did on North American catfishes. And so I, I used the same approach. And so this is flathead catfish. The height of these lines represents body size. So flathead catfish are really big. That's why they're on top. Blue catfish, channel catfish, brown bullhead, black bullhead. They all show evidence of countergradient growth variation. And then this is the line for lake sturgeon from that previous paper. So this is definitely going on in catfish. And if you say, well, maybe, maybe um, if you ran the common garden, it might look a little bit different. Well, this is from a, a, another paper I did on striped bass where we actually had the data from the common gardens. And this is comparing the results you would get from common gardens to the results from the field data approach that I just showed. So the elevation of these lines are different. They get bigger in the common gardens. Um, but the slopes of these lines are basically the same. So in the case of striped bass, at least, it's telling you the same information, that there is evidence of countergradient growth in that species. And this is where I'm starting to try and tie it all together. These are the same graphs, and these are fishes, um, some mussel species, some trees, and then mammals. Anything, anybody notice anything different about the mammals? They have much higher slopes. Um, and so I really think that this pattern of countergradient growth and the degree to which that growth compensation occurs might be going on, might be responsible for Bergman's role. And so this is what I'm sort of keying in on a little bit. But there's another thing that goes on. Um, food availability is another potential option. It makes a lot of sense with fish when you consider that, like in Canada, there are these huge mayfly hatches that occur around lakes. And they happen right in the middle of the growing season. Um, so aside from that, adaptation for faster growth, there might just be more food um, in the north as well. So there, there's probably a combination of countergradient growth and food availability at play here. 
Okay, I want to try to bring it all in here, tie it all together, and go out with a bang. Okay, so again, this is the problem. And um, what we're really trying to do here is find new ways to better manage our natural resources. And again, my argument is if we understand the ecology of species a little bit better, we might be able to understand the management of species a little bit better. And this is important for a variety of reasons, one of which is that things are changing out there. Um, this is by a guy named Ar Ar um, Robert Arlinghouse. He's a German researcher. And things have happened already in Germany that are kind of interesting. He's basically shown that people stopped taking their kids fishing in Germany a long time ago. And what's happened as a result is that um, people have grown up with a different ethic, a different environmental ethic. It's not good or bad, it's just a different ethic, um, but it's very different. So for example, in Germany, um, over 60% of people view competitive fishing as immoral. So that ethic of um, fishing as a, as a thing everybody does has really changed over time. And he's published these papers as kind of a coming to a theater near you, America. Um, he may be right, he may not be right. I know people that can argue both ways, but I think the point is that things are changing out there, both from an ecological standpoint and a social standpoint. And we probably need to be thinking more broadly about um, fisheries ecology, fisheries management, and how it all works together, probably in a different way than we historically have. It's, it has been kind of going on in the US. A lot of states are struggling with declining fishing license sales. Um, it hasn't been an issue in Wisconsin yet, um, but that's primarily due to baby boomers retiring and spending more time fishing. If you look at license sales among younger demographics, they've been declining for years. Um, and this is going on in total license sales in many states already. For example, Virginia is seeing this already. This is going to totally upend how conservation work is funded, how it's conducted over the next 30 years. It's something we should all be thinking about, and it's something that I think how we conceptualize research should be thinking about as well. So in a lot of ways, I feel like in most of the places I've been, people have talked past each other. People shouting ecology, people shouting fisheries. And in reality, we're studying the same thing. Um, you know, as the DNR, we have a very clear mission statement. It hasn't changed over time. We're supposed to manage the resource. We're supposed to do it sustainably. We're supposed to do it for future generations. Um, which may or may not be different from how we think about things. Um, so all this is, is to say, um, I don't know, things are changing, and um, hopefully we can figure out new and better ways to do it. So I just want to acknowledge a lot of people, a lot of funding resources that have contributed to all this. And again, it's great to be here. Take any questions. <laughs> Yeah. I was very interested in your the walleye statement and you talked about the, the yield to the production ratio, the sort of the break point was about twenty percent. Right. So that there was two or three different cases. Um, that's very similar to the kind of the rule of thumb for the spawning potential ratio, which is another way of looking at kind of the same thing. Not yep. exactly Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So um, I'm supposed to repeat the question in this mic, but uh, so <laughs> the question is about 20% sustainable exploitation for walleye, and um, yeah, we've talked about this a lot. There seems to be something sort of magical about 20%, um, particularly with walleye, and and we don't really know why. What I what I can tell you is that um, I talked a little bit about P2B rates. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the average P2B rate for Y is about 0.2, um, or once every five years. I mean, that is the replacement rate for the production. Um, so I think there's probably, I, I don't know that that idea is out there, that sustainable exploitation might be kind of like P2B rates. But I know in Nigel Lester's work, he suggested that sustainable exploitation should be about natural mortality. 
which natural mortality and P2B are very similar to one another. So um, there certainly is something ma <laughs> magical about the 20%. And yeah, it's interesting that it keeps coming up. Yeah. You also mentioned 12% as where you're kind of aiming for or what it's <coughs> actually managed for. Yeah. I'm wondering if you're taking out the full annual production of 20%, what's left over for the raccoons? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, um, so the 12%, um, you know, this is my, this is my argument with, with um, managing based on percent of the population is that that 12% can be composed of a lot of different things. You can have 12% by harvesting a bunch of babies. You can have 12% by harvesting only adults. But from a biological and eco ecological standpoint, those are very different things. What's great about production is that it integrates that. So you can get to 12% um, or 100% of the production in a variety of ways. You can harvest um, you know, a moderate amount of big fish or a lot of small fish. Um, and so it, it's really integrating the, the size and biomass of what's harvested more than just the numbers. And the numbers can mean a lot of different things. You can have 12% a lot of, a lot of different ways. That's what I think is cool about the production. Yeah, Kevin. So you mentioned uh, you were early at the end of the walleye stuff. You were talking about uh, reproduction at some point. Or yeah. Maintaining that. And from what I understand about walleye in Wisconsin, a lot of them are stocked, and the sort of the, the stock that they use is sort of like a, a riverine based walleye stock. And I would imagine they probably all come from probably about the same hatch roots, more or less. So the stock that they're using is all essentially the same. And yeah. I wonder what impact. Reproduction, yep. the quality of the stock they use, whether it's been selected for kind of survival in yeah. hatcheries rather than you know other properties that would make them better in terms of reproducing in the wild. So yep. that probably contributes somewhat to this. So <coughs> the question is about stocking, walleye stocking, how that plays into things. And uh, so it's a very complex. Um, and so the short story is that we have we have some populations that look for recruitment codes where they sort of judge this stuff and then stocking decisions are based on these sort of crazy recruitment codes. Um, so we definitely stock a lot of lakes where there's no hope for any reproduction that's going to go on. But we do stock some lakes where there's a little bit of natural reproduction. Um, but our good lakes, we don't, we don't stock those at all. Um, and in the good lakes, we've seen declining recruitment. Um, so these are lake, lakes that haven't been stocked. In some cases, we're seeing more severe recruitment in those situations. Um, <coughs> so it's, it's hard to say that's not to say it couldn't still be a factor. I mean, a lot of these systems are connected to each other. And then there's the old bake bucket biologist problem that people move fish around. Um, so the genetics still could be. But you know, I've been heartened. I mean, we've looked at walleye genetics a couple different times. Brian Sloss has done some of this work. And every time we look at the genetics, we find that they've retained their signal over time. Even with all this craziness going on, there's those strains are still unique. There might be a little pollution going on, but they're still pretty unique. And so I've been kind of heartened by the, by the conservation of the genetics in walleye in Wisconsin over time. But yeah, if somebody can figure out a better way to grow walleye <laughs> so that they'll reproduce in these systems, it'd be great. <laughs> Or maybe not so, depending on your <laughs> point of view. <laughs> yeah. So you did that study with the, the climate change in different populations north and south. Another thing that I kind of thought of is if there's another thing that changes in those regions, right. that wind, yep. take a look at that at all. Because I looked at those lakes down in Indiana, there was a lot more Absolutely. You know, pollution. I know you don't want to talk about that bit. But yeah, I kind of glossed over that, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's, um, that's sort of the problem with those data is that um, both of those factors are going on. So temperature and land use are collinear with each other on that Cisco gradient. So it gets warmer as you go north to south, but it also the land use also changes as you go north to south. Um, so that's kind of where we are with the study, is we're trying to acquire the land use um, data from Landsat and create a model that would Again, it, it wouldn't be a perfect model, but it, it might suggest whether temperature or land use was more or less important in the model. 
What I can tell you is that there's some interesting patterns in those Indiana lakes. Um, the, there's like five lakes that have retained Cisco in Indiana. They're all deep, um, so they all have cold water habitat, but they all also have small lake sheds, um, which is kind of like the land use idea, that they're not draining these huge agricultural regions with a lot of phosphorus. And so I think land use is hugely important, and maybe we can kind of cursely get at it with a model, um, but we'll never be able to definitively say, I don't think. It's, it's obviously a problem. Yeah, Mike. You touched on that a little bit, but I wonder if you could expand on, if you looked at density dependence, you know, why all of these things are pushing populations further and further back, we're going to see any kind of shock recruitment response, those populations are going to recover. Yeah. Have you just hit the high end of carrying capacity for some of these systems, and that's why recruitment failed? Yeah, there, um, there definitely is density dependence going on. Um, for example, we've, we've done some work with how growth rates have changed over time. So growth rates of old fish have declined, but growth rates of young fish have actually increased recently, and that's probably a density-dependent response. We have done some uh, population dynamic models um, that suggest density dependence is not um, the factor going on. Everything seems to point to um, a recruitment issue um, where we know that walleye are successfully reproducing. They're reproducing, we can see the eggs, they're having successful swim up, um, but then they disappear and we don't see them again until the fall when we do our recruitment surveys. Um, so something's happening between swim up and the fall where they're, where they're being lost. And this, that is the million dollar question. Is where are they going? Are they getting eaten? Are they getting eaten by bass? Are they getting eaten by sunfish? Um, are they starving to death because there's not enough zooplankton because the phenology is all messed up? Um, is it a habitat issue that there's just not enough habitat for them to um, you know, survive in? Um, so we, we just don't know. Um, so there's a lot of potential studies we're talking about about trying to figure out what that bottleneck is. And then there's potentially another bottleneck um, because we see them when they're in the fall of their first year, but then we don't see them again until they're about three years old and they start showing up in the fike nets. So there's another bottleneck that probably occurs when they're one and two years old that we know even less about. <laughs> so studying fish recruitment is just really hard. It's like banging your head against the wall. Um, I wish we knew. It, it is the million dollar question. Yeah. Did you try to uh, just leave bag limits alone at 25 and put on like a minimum size limit or a slot or something to try to improve yeah. size while also trying to improve size structure and so did anglers overwhelmingly respond negatively? To yeah. Um, so I personally <coughs> believe that uh, minimum size limits could be successful for, for bluegill. Um, one of our initial proposed regulations was something like that. It was a, we called it an N over X regulation. So it was like, um, it was like a 25 bag limit, but only three could be above, I think maybe seven inches or something like that. So the idea was to sort of harvest the abundant small fish and try to conserve those big, particularly the parental males. Um, anglers didn't like it. And what I was really surprised at was that our, the conservation officers didn't like it. They said, they showed up at some of the meetings and said, you know, if we run into a family of five, we're going to be measuring fish all afternoon and we won't be able to do our jobs. And so, you know, we, we were kind of stuck with the bag limits for those reasons. Um, but, you know, bag limits are, can be good. They're easy to understand. Um, they're easy to enforce. Um, they're not the, the things I would necessarily pick. What I really wanted was a closed season um, um, during the spawning season. I thought that our creel data show that about 50% of the harvest is occurring during the spawning season for bluegill. And I thought, you know, if you could take some lakes and just shut it down for a few weeks, you could probably really protect some of the parental males that way, especially lakes with deep habitat where the fish kind of suspend in the summer. They'd still get pounded through the ice, but, um, but I really thought a season makes a lot of sense for bluegill. But we got the reduced bag during the spawning season, so that was kind of the compromise. That's tough. Managing bluegill is like banging your head against the wall, too. <laughs> yeah. 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 Ye
they have the alternate life history strategies, parentals and sneakers and satellites, and it gets complicated really fast. <coughs> All right, thanks everybody.